what was scheduled to be our last lecture, no, second to last lecture of the year, but it isn't. It, we have more coming. Um, um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Glenn Leroy, and I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design. In a moment, we'll have our speaker, but I did want to announce uh, two more events to you all. Next week is a big lecture also for us. Charles Renfro of New York will be here. And it's also the night of our AIAS student auction that funds, among other things, Freedom by Design. That starts at 5 p.m. with the lecture coming at 6 p.m. And just so that you all know, uh, one of the auction items is there will be one student that will be able to bid uh, uh, to have a dinner with us afterwards with Charles Renfro and one professional will be able to bid to have dinner that night with Charles Renfro. And so those are two items that, so for professionals and students, we have, we have those things for you. Um, and uh, it'll be a fun night. And then on, uh, and so that's next Thursday, one week from tonight, and then the 10th, April 10th, um, we're having Eric Hill, who is a professor at the uh, University of Michigan, but uh, a well-known expert on Michigan modern housing, and uh, he will be here to give a lecture on, on that subject. So put in your calendars those two dates, next, next Thursday and then April 10th, and I think both of them will be very good lectures. Now, with that said, I want to introduce Professor Martin Swartz, who um, is the Associate Chair of Architecture, and uh, many, of, many of you know him as a, as a professor of superlative qualities here, and, uh, and he will introduce our speaker tonight. Thanks. Um, it's, a pleasure for me to introduce, it's a pleasure for me to introduce John Ronan, whose work I've admired for quite a long time now. I'll tell you a little bit about him. He's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Michigan and an MARC at Harvard. He's a recipient of a number of awards and recognitions, including a few of these I want to tell you about. In 1999, he won the Townhouse Revisited Competition, which was sponsored by the Graham Foundation. He was named one of the Design Vanguard by Architectural Record. Um, and one of the emerging voices by the Architectural uh, Coalition of New York. He has received, he and his firm has received two national AIA honor awards, one of which is for his wonderful building for the Poetry Foundation, which he'll be showing us tonight. And he's a teacher, he's a professor at IIT, which is a school with some similarities to ours. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome John Ronan. Thank you, Martin. Okay, let's see if we can swing this here. <clears throat> we had a great trip to the GM Tech Center today. Someone could uh, hit the lights for me. Um, which I want to thank uh, the people here for setting up because it's a building that I've always wanted to see. I talk about it in my classes, but I've never seen it. Very hard to get into. We found out today it's um, probably easier to get into the Federal Reserve Bank than it is to get into the GM Tech Center. <laughs> <laughs> Just hit them all. Everything is <laughs> Just kill the circuit breaker, but don't kill the projector. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. No, that's good. Let's turn this one off too. Yeah, I don't need this one. Okay, let's turn that off. Okay, so yeah, hit those spots. If you can. Well, it would be good to turn those spots off. <clears throat> anyway, so I'll just start. I'm, I'm just going to talk about two projects tonight and um, in a little bit more depth and really um, two stories. And so the first one uh, is about uh, Gary Comer. And this is Gary Comer is the man you see there on the screen. Uh, he's the founder of the Land's End Company. And one day, uh, Gary, near the end of his life, took a trip down memory lane uh, to visit the old neighborhood that he grew up in. 
and he found uh, the neighborhood's called Grand Crossing because of the intersection of two railroad lines in Chicago. And he, he came back and saw that the neighborhood had fallen into a state of decline. Uh, it was being ravaged by poverty, drugs, and gangs. And Gary decided to do something about it. So um, this is the neighborhood here. Um, <clears throat> do you have that the, the pointer thing? Um, the, the red block is the site. We started, um, he started by proving, uh, improving the elementary school, um, which is located not far uh, from that red site uh, on the image there. And in the course of helping the elementary school, he met a man named Arthur Robertson. And, um, <clears throat> cool. Okay. Arthur Robertson ran a uh, 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 performance troupe called the South Shore Drill Team. And they were, it's a 300 member performance troupe of kids age eight to 18. And everyone wants to be in this club, on this drill team. And uh, Arthur was a strict disciplinarian. You had to stay uh, off drugs, out of gangs, maintain your grades and so forth. So this, this uh, troop was having a very positive impact uh, on the community. And, and Gary wanted to do something for them. The problem was uh, they had no place uh, to practice and they had no place to perform. So Gary started by saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build a uh, performance space for these guys. And so that's how the project started out. It started out as a gym, basically, a place that they could practice. We first looked at kind of renovating some buildings in town, uh, like the ones that you see on the screen, but they were in, in a pretty bad structural state and the sites were contaminated. So we ended up taking this site here, tearing the buildings down and, um, and starting over. Um, <clears throat> so in the process of working on this project, Gary's ambition had grown, and what started as a gym was an evolving into something much more. It was a youth center uh, supporting a wide range of youth recreation and educational programs, and what you're seeing on the screen there are some early study models of the project with the drill team functions shown in red, and then these other ancillary uh, educational programs shown uh, in the different colors. And so <clears throat> it was a very fluid situation. Uh, uh, we were trying to design it and the program kept changing. You know, Gary would get an idea to, uh, you know, one week it was a health clinic, the next week it was a high school for troubled teens, and then it was job training. So, um, <clears throat> but he was very anxious about getting the building built. So it was a very unorthodox uh, way to program the building. So uh, we, we came up, we had to devise a strategy whereby we could proceed with the design, but we could add programs over time. So the partee that you see on the screen there is the one that we eventually latched on to where we would put the drill team spaces in the center and then wrap uh, around those spaces in these kind of programmatically indeterminate bars programs that we could kind of plug in over time as they came online or even after, um, after the building uh, uh, was open. So, and then these bars would terminate in important spaces like art rooms and dance rooms and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, these are some of the early kind of uh, study models and the site plan. The idea was be a lot of adaptability, uh, multifunctioning. So the parking lot here functions as a practice parade ground. The idea, kind of spatial idea, would be one of sort of a, a, a spatial layering, whereby one could be in one space but experience uh, two or three other spaces at the same time. So you could be both actor and spectator at the same time. So this is in the cafeteria looking through the gym and out uh, the back of the building. The center, uh, the main space in the building was this convertible gym, which is a, a practice space for the drill team, but converts to a 625 uh, seat theater uh, uh, through a kind of a deployable uh, seating system. These are uh, some images or sections through the site. Above, uh, above the uh, gym would be this, uh, uh, this, this roof garden that I'll talk about in a minute. These are some of the spaces on the second floor. So in these bars, we would have different programs such as dance rooms, uh, music rooms, art rooms, uh, offices for the drill team. And then on the third floor, ringing this very large roof garden would be classrooms, exhibition spaces, lecture halls, uh, computer labs, and so forth. <clears throat> There's a section uh, through the building, um, <clears throat> kind of a longitudinal section showing kind of an early uh, idea for what that roof garden might be. We didn't want to just do a, an old roof garden, uh, green roof. We wanted to make it more of an outdoor horticultural classroom so that it reinforced the educational mission uh, of the building. So talk more about that in a minute. 
These are kind of some uh, early renderings, <clears throat> some studies. Uh, we wanted the, the clan, and Gary was very adamant that this was not a community center, it was a youth center, and he wanted it to be about the kids. And he said, I'm going to start with the kids and make their lives better. So um, the, the, the coloration of the building is really reflective of the drill team itself, their uniforms in colorful flags. Uh, and, and it was, uh, the building was meant to sort of project a kind of a youth and an optimism. So what you see on the screen are some early uh, mock-ups of the cladding, which started out more muted. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, the, the community actually uh, requested kind of more vivid, uh, bright colors. This is um, uh, a stainless steel siding uh, that transitions to sort of a, uh, a, a perforated uh, stainless steel siding, which will be kind of a, a recurring sort of detail tonight, which I'll explain uh, in another project. Here's some construction photos of that building. Um, looking down into kind of this main space, you can already see sort of the main space there and how these uh, spaces that ring around it will sort of look down on that space and maybe feed off of its energy. These are uh, photos of the uh, construction underway. It was a steel brace frame building with, with concrete block infill. Uh, and then that is waterproof. So if you see in this image here, uh, the type of construction is a very layered one. So the, the <coughs> design became about sort of playing with these layers. So the layers that you're seeing here are, um, are stepping back as you know, the steel frame and then the block wall. Uh, <coughs> that black that you see there is actually waterproofing on the block. Over that goes the sort of blue insulation board. Over that goes kind of a black geotextile fabric. And the very far end there, you can see them starting to put on the cladding. So unlike kind of the older buildings where the wall had to do many different things, this is a more layered uh, construction uh, where the cladding takes on this public role. So the design is really about sort of manipulating uh, these different layers. This is the roof garden under construction, kind of showing the structure. That's the top cord of a seven foot deep truss that spans uh, across that space. And then a little bit further on, this is sort of putting the soil in. This is a special engineered soil. Um, it's a very lightweight soil, but very uh, with lots of nutrients and so forth for, for the plants <coughs> that will be in there. And then kind of fi the final completed, uh, completed cladded building. So these are some images. On the upper right is basically the safe passage route. We located the site close to the elementary school where a lot of kids would be coming from to go to this building. And so that's a very short uh, sort of passage there. And it's all, uh, it's got quite a bit of security cameras and so forth. Um, I mentioned the, the parking lot is uh, actually a, a practice parade ground. So that's uh, quite a wide variety of events uh, can be held in, that, uh, in, the, in the parking lot. So the drill team will practice there. They'll have events there, barbecues. And, and the mayor of Chicago even announced his, um, he was running again for mayor uh, from the drill team space. There's two uh, entrances. This is the ground floor plan you see here. There's really two entrances. There's a street entrance um, <clears throat> on the right side of the page to the south, and uh, the uh, image on the right side. And then there's a parking lot entrance, uh, which you see on the left here. So there's a little plaza. You walk under this bridge and then into the building. And then <clears throat> you're in this kind of uh, lobby space here, which if I turned it on, it would work better. Let's try this. So this is the uh, pedestrian entrance. This is the parking lot out here. You come in to this large lobby space. This uh, seating rolls out from underneath the floor here. So it all, this all compacts into sort of a six foot deep space, and then it rolls out. There's doors here that correspond to the aisles. So when there's a, a performance or an event, people come in and then go down and sit here. These doors open to reveal this very large stage. There's a stage shop here, kitchen. This is a cafeteria, uh, which overlooks the gym and is on the same level uh, as the lobby here. This is this, um, some views that kind of show uh, what spatially what it's like to be on this level. And this is notion of spatial layering, where I can be in the cafeteria here, looking through the gym and out uh, to the parking outside. This is also in the cafeteria. This is a, a study hall up here. These are uh, offices 
for uh, the guys that run the drill team so they can keep an eye on what's happening below. And then this is actually uh, kind of a, a follow spot room. So a follow spot is a, is a light that can uh, follow a performer on stage, but they also have a movie, kind of a theater grade movie projector there. So on Friday nights, they can have movies and, and so on and so forth. But the idea is really to create a sense of community because the, the, the building serves 1,200 kids, only 300 of whom are on this drill team. So the idea was uh, if everybody can see what's going on here, we create this sort of sense of community between all the different building users. So more kind of spatial uh, uh, images here. This is uh, the drill team practicing in the gym. And then you're looking up through the cafeteria here, which is double height, and then on into the rec room uh, on the second floor. This is looking down from the fitness area across to the study hall and then down into the cafeteria. <coughs> Behind these panels are where uh, the seating comes out, uh, where the seating deploys. So the basketball hoops are all kind of foldable. The, the, the gym mats go away, basketball hoops come down. You can see the slot for blackout curtains, which actually form acoustical function and so forth. The block is all acoustical block. So really, that space was designed more as a theater that, that transforms into a gym than a gym that, that transforms into a theater. So um, you can see the two modes here. So this is just uh, guys hanging out. Uh, there's skylights in the roof garden above that bring natural light in. Um, I'll talk <coughs> more about that in a minute. This is with the seats deployed. The doors that cover the stage open and then panels, motorized panels in the ceiling open and that's where all the stage lighting is up here. So there's a catwalk up here behind this stretch fabric ceiling. Um, there's catwalks and mechanical and acoustical stuff. And then uh, up here, there's a, there's a blackout curtain that comes down and, and makes that, darkens the space, but also makes it kind of acoustically ideal. So here you can see with the panels removed, this is the lobby up here. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the panels removed, exposing uh, the seats that come out. And they're real theater seats, upholstered, and so forth. The doors are in alignment with the aisle, so you can just kind of walk in the building and, and stroll down into the seating. <clears throat> this is um, a view on a uh, crowd gathering for a performance. And then these are some uh, performance shots. So the stage is actually quite large because the drill team will have you know, up to 50 people on stage at one time. So it was very, it, it, the stage had to be sort of tailor-made for them. There were very few venues in town uh, that they could actually perform in because of this requirement to accommodate uh, so many people on stage. This is the second floor. And so this kind of notion of kind of this uh, programmatically indeterminate space where you could plug in different programs uh, which we did over the course of the design and over the course of the construction. Um, <clears throat> this area is a rec room that looks like this. A uh, little fitness room here. This is a costume shot for the drill team. This is the fly loft over the stage. Music and band rooms in a, in a, in a two level uh, art room. These are offices for the drill team and a little study hall there. Um, this is looking down from the recreation room through the cafeteria and on into the gym. This is the art room. So this is the north facing art room. It faces the alley. And then this is the dance room here. So these bars, there were four bars, a white one, a silver one, a red and a blue. And they all terminate in important spaces. So the, the um, blue one actually terminates in this uh, dance room, which you see on the outside here. So what we would do is we would um, <clears throat> advertise the activity that's happening inside the building to the community so they could, they could kind of be excited about participating, which was harder than it sounds because when we had our first meeting uh, with, the, with the drill team, they said, um, we, we showed a very glassy kind of model and they said, you know, what is, is, is this a window? And we said, yeah. And they said, don't put any windows in this building <clears throat> because, um, you know, there was, there was too many drive-by shootings in the neighborhood, too much violence, and kids would drive by and shoot. So they asked for no windows. And the owner, Gary Comer, kind of liked bricks. So he wanted, he said, I don't care. Whatever you do, but just do it in brick. So I was faced with doing uh, a sort of a, a brick building with no windows, which I had no interest in doing. So there was a lot of um, um, uh, a lot of kind of persuading to do, and and, and so we had to be um, 
you know, I didn't want to create a building. Uh, what I was really concerned with was about the feel of the building inside and the atmosphere. I wanted it to be very light and airy inside in a place where kids wanted to be. Um, you know, the place where they really wanted to be, where they felt comfortable, but they felt safe too. So how do you do that if you can't really put windows in the exterior? So a lot of the light that comes into the building actually comes in through the roof and in protected areas that are inside of the site. And very little light actually comes from the outside. Where we did uh, eventually have situations like this, um, <clears throat> where we had glass out on the street, this is actually bullet resistant glass up to that line. So <clears throat> uh, that's how, uh, so if you actually go to the building, uh, it, it's kind of, um, ironic a little bit because it looks very enclosed on the outside but it's actually quite light and airy on the inside so and, and, and all this glazing is actually an important part of that because each space is borrowing light from different spaces so for instance this is a uh, kind of on a bridge uh, in front of the uh, music rooms that's looking through a courtyard and then into the gym and then through the gym and out into the street beyond this is um, the third floor plan is organized uh, a lot like the second floor plan. Um, this would be uh, sort of a lecture exhibition hall. These are classrooms here. This is um, uh, a computer lab, a recording studio, the second level of the art room. And then this is a gardening room for this big, large roof garden, and then building offices and so forth. So <clears throat> um, this room would later go on to be, this room was subdividable in two. That's this room here. So you can see these tracks in the ceiling. That was so that we could subdivide that room into classrooms. And later on, uh, several years later, they started a high school in this building. And they used these four rooms as the classroom uh, to start the building, which is sort of a, a confirmation of the strategy, sort of the flexibility strategy. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. But little different things can happen here, performances, lectures, um, exhibitions, and so forth. This is the large roof garden, which is planted with two feet of soil. So um, <clears throat> again, we wanted this to be not just a green roof, but uh, something that would reinforce the mission, uh, Gary's mission of education. So we said, well, why don't we we'll make this a horticultural classroom? Kids will plant uh, food crops, flowers, and things like this. And then they'll take them down uh, into the kitchen, the kind of the kitchen on the ground floor, and use them in cooking classes. So that's exactly uh, what they did. Um, the, 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 the roof garden became phenomenally uh, uh, popular with the students, who many of whom, uh, the kids that come to this building have never been to a farm. They don't know where uh, food comes from, and they've never kind of experienced how you plant something, grow something, harvest it, and then you, you cook something with it and you eat it. So seeing that whole cycle was kind of an eye-opening experience and opened up a lot of possibilities uh, for them in terms of kind of careers in culinary arts, uh, restaurants, uh, cooking. So um, they, they haul uh, or they harvest uh, over six tons of food out of this roof garden every year. And uh, they uh, restaurant tours have contracted with them to grow uh, sort of exotic herbs and so forth. So uh, it's actually sort of a, there's a commercial or business aspect uh, to it too. And it's so popular that across the street, they've expanded the garden at grade and have uh, more gardens <coughs> over there. <coughs> so here's the section, excuse me. <coughs> this is the roof garden here. These are the round skylights that bring light into the gym. Um, this is um, the kind of projection room and then stage here, stage and fly line. This is a view, uh, this is the longitudinal section. So this is this area, <clears throat> this area kind of um, coming in from the parking lot functions as a stage. So they'll set up the parking lot with chairs and so forth and there's a covered stage so they can have very large events. So if, they, if 625 uh, people is, is too small, they can fit you know, roughly a thousand out here for an outdoor event. The uh, tower was really a gesture um, to give uh, the place a center. So Grand Crossing, this neighborhood, um, 
uh, doesn't really have much of an identity. So part of the agenda of this project was to give the community an identity, make them proud of something, that this was sort of the center of their community. So this tower multifunctions as well. It's kind of uh, uh, functions uh, the way a, a steeple in a medieval town might function, but also has the very practical use of um, advertising upcoming events in the youth center. There's, a, there's an elevated highway uh, <clears throat> that brings people into town right across the street from this building. So this, that sign can be seen from the highway. These are some kind of early drawings of that tower. <coughs> so you can see how we kind of, um, <clears throat> this cladding, we sort of snuck uh, little windows in here and there. Uh, but more or less disguise them in the cladding, very large expanses of <clears throat> these are some of the studies. So we wrote an algorithm to um, uh, deploy these sort of six different panels in each color, and then we kind of uh, finessed it visually. This is uh, the panels actually going on the building. So uh, what you're seeing here is this is over the insulation in the block. Uh, there's these kind of metal uh, furring strips here that the panels are mechanically attached to. So we were, we were concerned with uh, vandalism and concerned with graffiti. And the strategy that we took here was, well, we can, there's one strategy that says, well, we will do something, let's say precast or something, make it very smooth so that we can get the graffiti off, we can clean it when it happens. And, and, uh, another strategy is, well, well, we'll take a relatively inexpensive material that's easily uh, installed and we'll train uh, people in the neighborhood to install this and uh, they'll work for the building and we'll keep a stock of these and when the graffiti comes, we'll just pop off the panels and put new ones on. So <clears throat> that was the strategy that we took. Um, I'm happy to say that the graffiti problem never happened, um, although we've had a couple of bullets, stray bullets. Um, hit the building or go through uh, that, that first layer there. So here you can see kind of the windows that are surreptitiously sort of snuck into that pattern there. Again, this is, um, uh, the colors are really meant to reference the drill team's uh, costumes and uniforms and so forth. This is a very busy street out here and the, and the raised planters are such that, are designed such that a car can't kind of jump the curb and come up onto the building. This is a view of a view from the alley of the uh, art room, which faces north. And then this is the building at night. So it takes on a very kind of theatrical look at night. Um, this is uh, we wanted the kids to feel the kids in the drill team when they were having a performance that this was like a real production. And so the bu the building has takes on this kind of very glamorous um, <clears throat> aspect at night, uh, particularly on nights where there's uh, performances and so forth. So <clears throat> that, um, um, <clears throat> this was another strategy here. Uh, just before I leave this project, this was, um, this is, remember the mock-up of the stainless steel that becomes perforated. We drag that over the windows to kind of hide these windows. So we were kind of hiding these windows in the pattern here and then covering them here is another strategy and then doing the bullet resistant glass here. So um, there was a big push. That building was done at a very quick timetable. The whole thing was done in a year and a half or, or two years from design through construction, uh, which is quite a uh, compressed amount of time for a building of that size. And uh, because Gary found out that he had cancer uh, when we were uh, in design, he had a recurring kind of bone marrow cancer. He wasn't going to live that long. So there's a great rush to get the project finished. And we finished it um, uh, a couple months before he passed away. Several years later, the Comer Foundation came back to us and they said, we have a new idea. We want to do a charter high school in the neighborhood because the kids, um, they had been working on this elementary school over here. Um, they wanted to have a, a choice for parents in the neighborhoods to send um, <clears throat> their kids to a, a, a really uh, a high school with kind of high standards. So they, they enlisted Noble Network, which is kind of the Cadillac charter operator in Chicago, uh, to build a school with them. So uh, as I mentioned, they actually started it in the youth center in four rooms on the third floor here. Uh, but 
after two years, they would become too large and would need a new building. So <clears throat> we, um, we started to design a building in this area here. So unfortunately, they only had control of the lots from here to here. They didn't control this, which was a bar, or this, which was a tire shop. So we had to start design, we had to place the building here because we had to start the building in order to finish it in time for the, for the students to move out of it and into this building. Um, <clears throat> but they only owned these lots and they were working on these. This guy, the bar owner was holding out. He knew he was sitting on a gold mine. So he held out as long as possible. And eventually when they threatened him with eminent domain, they finally got it, but that was that was well into construction. So the Charter High School uh, explains why the Charter High School sits where it does. The idea was um, to use the youth center during the daytime when kids were in school, so uh, when, it, when it was more or less uh, empty in school. So the idea, this charter school is really more or less a classroom building, and the students walk back and forth to the youth center to do enrichment courses here. So they use the gym, cafeteria, uh, music rooms, band rooms, computer labs, and so forth. So it's, it's really kind of a campus where uh, the classrooms here, enrichment classrooms here, and then the kids would walk back and forth. <coughs> when we finally got the bar, we created this kind of little plaza space. When we finally got the tire shop, um, we, we turned this into faculty parking here. <coughs> We didn't have um, uh, the money to do, uh, this had maybe half the budget of the youth center, so we had to somehow, uh, like the youth center, make it feel kind of light and airy, but also inviting and welcoming, but also very secure. So we um, took what we started on the third floor there of kind of uh, uh, pulling this sort of metal across the windows, and this was an existing fence that comes off of the youth center, and that travels along and becomes uh, the facade of the high school and it wraps around it on three sides and then heads back over to the youth center. So we wanted to kind of bind these together in a campus, but we wanted uh, the high school to have its own identity. So um, I chose this sort of wasabi green color because all of the teachers are very young in age. I think the principal was 30, but everybody else was younger than 30. And so I thought <coughs> it should really reflect the kind of the youth and, and real spirit of the school. So here you can see where the, uh, <clears throat> this screen comes along and then becomes uh, continuous here and then over the windows um, <clears throat> becomes perforated again. There's a little plaza here. So there's a gate. <clears throat> there's a gate here that opens up so the kids don't have to uh, wait here in the morning for school to open up. They come in and they wait in this quad area because in a neighborhood like this, um, the kids that actually want to kind of go to school and, 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 and do better and, and make something of their lives are often targets so, uh, of the other kids, so we didn't want them kind of congregating or having to wait in front of the building. So this is that sort of quad area uh, as the students came to term it, and that, that's where they kind of, that's their sort of social space. This is the kids walking back from the youth center. Uh, that's one of the teachers. <clears throat> <coughs> this is the view from the parking lot. So this kind of notion of spatial layering that we had started in the youth center, I wanted to continue on into this building. This is um, a view from the sidewalk. You can see the youth center down there. And then this is from the second floor looking through the parking lot uh, at the youth center beyond. Uh, some shots from the alley here. So, and then this is looking down into the uh, teacher's parking, which is kind of a porous pave. There's a little kind of rain garden out here and uh, some other kind of sustainable things. So <clears throat> this is um, the, the effect that we noticed when we did the first building was it was very hard uh, to see in during the daytime into the building, but very easy to see out. So this is a science classroom. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, almost a sunshade that this uh, perforated metal has, but from the outside, the building would look very kind of streamlined, be very difficult to kind of see in in the daytime, because we didn't have the money to do bullet resistant glass, but I wanted the building to be very kind of airy and light filled. So <clears throat> the other thing we did is we brought a, a linear skylight uh, that runs the length of the building, the length of the core here and here, 
and we made the front of the classrooms all glass. So <clears throat> the building, the classroom is getting light from this side and from the skylight through. So um, this is the lobby, kind of where you come in. Uh, you go up the sort of blue stair, you can see a little peak at that skylight that brings natural light uh, down into the building. <coughs> Some views of the kids. We worked with the principal. There's all, um, all these kind of quotes in College Crests were uh, things my office did in conjunction with the principal. There's a college classroom, so the whole idea is to get the kids thinking about college from the minute they walk in. So there's a sort of a college style classroom um, to get the kids inured uh, to that kind of learning. This is a typical classroom and you can see the glass on the corridor here. So um, that's one of these classrooms. So that's glass. This is kind of a tack material. So each teacher has their own kind of tack material. They can put different color and they can put up what they want there. This is the skylight that runs the length here and then you notice the floor is sort of pulled away on the second floor. So this is the second floor. These are the lockers. Typically in a school, the lockers would be over here. So we put them over here and then pulled this floor away from the wall so that the light from the skylight gets all the way down to the ground floor. So, <clears throat> um, and then this is just some more views, <coughs> excuse me, showing the light kind of coming through uh, the skylight there, the lockers, and then the glass into the classroom. The section, you can kind of see how all this is working. This is the street facade here. Um, <clears throat> so we have a high sill on the ground floor, uh, so a high window. And then on the second floor, the window starts at, at grade, or at the, the floor level and goes up to eight feet. This is the skylight that runs the length of the building. And you can see how the second floor is pulled away here, so the light comes in through this glass and then all the way down to the ground floor through this glass too. So every classroom is getting daylight from, from two directions. It has a very, so it looks, um, it's sort of, uh, from the outside it looks very kind of hermetic, kind of streamlined, hermetic, um, but inside it's very extremely kind of light, uh, light filled. <coughs> uh, my firm did all the graphics, so they had a, <coughs> for the building, so we took images of the students and combined them with quotes and so forth. They had a little um, uh, kind of a, a saying or a motto uh, that we worked into. Um, it's a grit, zest, optimism, and gratitude, I think it was. And we worked in sort of images of kind of famous African-American achievers since 99% of the kids were African-American into the graphics there to really um, um, kind of set the tone for the whole school. Um, the second project I'm going to talk about is <clears throat> the Poetry Foundation, and <clears throat> this is really starts out as a story of two women. Um, the first one being a woman named Harriet Monroe, who in 1912 started Poetry Magazine in Chicago. And Poetry Magazine uh, has been published every month since October of 1912 and uh, without interruption, and it became the authority of poetry in the English language. And a lot of famous poets uh, had their first works published in poetry magazines. So Wallace Stevens, uh, people like William Carlos Williams, um, uh, uh, <coughs> um, uh, <clears throat> um, not T.S. Eliot, I'm thinking of, anyway. Not important. Important poets. Very influential magazine, but run on a shoestring budget. So <clears throat> came out every month. They had a little kind of office the size of a closet in, in, a, in a private library in Chicago, and they could barely pay the bills every month, but they kept producing this kind of world-renowned uh, publication. And then out of the blue, about 10 years ago, uh, a pharmaceutical heiress named Ruth Lilly um, gave them $100 million. <coughs> with no strings attached. Uh, Ruth was an aspiring poet who had sent her work into the magazine many times but had never been uh, selected for publication. But each time they wrote her a nice letter, an encouraging letter, and, um, and, and she thanked them by sending them this gift, big gift. And uh, when she died, she added another $100 million. So <coughs> we did programming. We did, uh, this was a more kind of sane, 
a conventional sort of programming exercise here. We actually sat down with people and talked to them and figured out what we were designing before we started designing. Um, and one of the things that the foundation told us is that they wanted, um, they wanted a garden in the building somewhere. And so the initial design studies here are um, <clears throat> uh, sort of strategies for how one combines a building and a garden, either through erosion or knotting or overlapping or interlocking and so forth. And then I took these strategies and put them on the site, made them site specific, and, and made these models. So all these models, um, these little sketch models um, were maybe done in an afternoon. But um, in an afternoon after I had been thinking about it for probably two and a half months <clears throat> through this kind of programming phase and so forth. So it was kind of like a download of all the, all the sort of different ideas. So uh, I, I grabbed the people that would be working on the project. We looked at this and talked about it. And this is the one we kind of all gravitated to. And it's the one that the Poetry Foundation was uh, gravitated to. And so it seemed to be sort of a consensus that this was this notion of creating a garden by erosion of a virtual volume as described by the L-shaped boundary of the site. So this is the site here. It's fatter at the uh, west end and then shallower at the east end. And the idea was we'd kind of carve out these spaces and that one would move through this and, and that the, the kind of building we would do would be somewhat against the grain of contemporary architecture. It wouldn't be about shape. It wouldn't be something uh, that you could understand in a single glance. Uh, <clears throat> it would be something that you would have to experience. And it would be uh, something that would unfold space by space, almost like a poem unfolds line by line. So off we set. This is some early, uh, an early kind of context model. So this, there's a lot of new development. All the new development in the neighborhood looks like this. It's kind of very tall, ugly, painted concrete um, condominium buildings. And so the, the, the building, as I saw, should be something of a sanctuary. And then this quality, an urban sanctuary, and this quality would only grow over time as these other lots became developed with buildings like this. So maybe in 25, 30 years, um, <clears throat> this would be kind of a, a, a canyon of buildings and then this little sort of jewel in there that would be sort of a respite from everything else. So, but even at this early stage, one can see this kind of notion of a membrane or a veil uh, on the street that allows partial sort of views into the building to kind of intrigue people. This is an early sketch uh, of kind of building organization. So there's an alley that runs uh, behind the building here. This is a um, North South Street, another street. <clears throat> the garden would be here. All the cellular spaces like offices and so forth would rim the, peri rim the perimeter here. And then we'd have kind of the open spaces would look down uh, into the garden here. <clears throat> it was a little bit further on, kind of working out the structural bays <clears throat> of the building. And then this would be kind of a sketch during design development. This would be the type of drawing that would be done uh, for me to communicate with m the, the, my staff that's working with me on the project. So here you can see the, um, the kind of the tectonic idea kind of coming out, which is the notion of uh, the building comprised of a series of layers of different materials that become compressed and expand. So <clears throat> we have kind of this black line representing this metal layer. Um, the blue is glass. The brown is wood, which would start off here in the library, jump upstairs, travel around, and then jump back down uh, over here. In the, this is the performance space. So this is where the poetry readings were held. And so this notion of kind of these layers that sometimes bunch up close together and then come out and expand and create uh, this unfolding sequence uh, which people would move through in between. Well, here's the second floor. Uh, you can see uh, these sort of large open office areas looking down <clears throat> into the garden here. So this is the notion of these. <clears throat> this is the wood system. So here we have a library here that starts out as shelving here, becomes a working library upstairs, and then drops down uh, for the performance space here. A glass wall that would move in and out to compress and expand the space. Um, the garden would be a hardscape space, uh, basically a concrete plane 
with trees and moss strips in it that would guide you to the front door. And then we would pull that garden slab into the building so that the public spaces of the building would feel like they're outside. And then finally, this layer of black oxidized zinc, which would be continuous uh, wrapping around the building and then become perforated or veil-like uh, at the garden to allow views into the garden. So <clears throat> here's some of the, um, the early models. And you can see the notion of that garden space as a mediator between the street and the enclosed building inside. And that would, from the street, it would have this sort of veil like quality that would intrigue people and, and kind of invite them to kind of uh, satisfy their curiosity and kind of come inside. So here's some views of the site. There were a couple of buildings on site in a, in a surface parking lot that were demolished to make way for the building. Building is um, a steel uh, frame, brace frame. You can see the frame going up. These are some shots during construction. Um, you can see them starting to put up the formwork for the garden. And then the completed building here. So this is the view from across the street. You can see how the layers are starting to kind of uh, compress together here. Um, this opening that sort of invites you in, but there's no sign of, of where the actual entrance to the building is. <clears throat> and one proceeds across the street. So this is kind of looking through, and one can see into that larger garden there. It would take on uh, different qualities, uh, different times of the day, according to the light. This is the step, so there's no markings on the building. It's just kind of a mute black object in the city <clears throat> that kind of uh, uh, says, you know, I'm something vaguely cultural. But only upon approach does one see the only signage in the building, which is actually in the step that takes you up into the garden. So this is the sidewalk here. And you step up two steps into the garden. And I wanted <clears throat> really to kind of uh, have a sense of removal, that you were kind of leaving the city behind and you were entering this other world. So you step up and your mind, <clears throat> you start kind of getting in this other frame of mind that this is a special uh, world here. So here's the step. Someone comes up, steps up into the garden. This is sort of a tribute area of the garden. You walk through. The large uh, main garden comes into space. These moss strips guide you to the front door. And then you would have, you would come in, there'd be a gallery space here that um, links this library space to the performance space where poetry readings are held. This stuff is all coats and bathrooms and back of house and so forth. So <clears throat> this is kind of stepping up into this tribute area. There was a tribute. We felt Ruth Lilly should be remembered here. So this is sort of a shadow box uh, condition here with one panel of reflective glass that's etched. And it says Ruth Lilly, friend and benefactor of poetry. And it, and it reflects the trees as if to say, you know, without Ruth's generosity, none of this uh, would have been possible. <clears throat> So continuing on, one steps up here and goes through this compressed zone here, and then comes out <clears throat> into, the, into the garden. And the library comes into view, announcing that you've kind of entered this literary, uh, this literary world. And <clears throat> so this is, um, um, I wanted there to be, uh, 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 because it's a very small building, very small site, this is sort of a way to kind of and make the building seem larger than, it's, than it really is, but also uh, a way to kind of prepare people mentally for what's inside. So you would walk through this space, and because <clears throat> poetry demands um, quite a bit of concentration. It's a very demanding art, and, uh, <clears throat> but, the, uh, but the rewards are very great if you're willing to give it that kind of attention. So this, this kind of walk to the front door and moving through this space is really about kind of leaving the city behind you can see it through the veil uh, of the perforated metal. And you can still hear the cars, but you feel apart from it at the same time. So it's a very interesting feeling to kind of be part of the city, but removed from it at the same time. <clears throat> These are some of the early sketches and, 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 and renderings of what that garden space might be like. <clears throat> this is a view at night. And then this is from the street at night looking into the building. So this is kind of this, um, uh, I'm employing this kind of a Japanese gardening technique here where 
you, you take a very kind of short space and you make it seem much deeper uh, by having your eyes stop multiple times. So your eye stops at the screen, and then it stops at the tree, and then it stops at the glass, and then it stops at the wall inside. So what is actually quite a compressed space actually feels uh, that it has quite a bit of depth and layer, almost like the, uh, the space has kind of a thickness to it. So this is uh, inside. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do is kind of stress the independence of this garden plane. So these joints and the concrete kind of come through um, so one can see the continuity of the concrete outside and coming inside, but also they're disaligned uh, with the mullions. <clears throat> and it took um, quite a bit of, uh, of study uh, to come up with this concrete. So concrete, as you know, is basically four ingredients. It's water, sand, cement, and stone. So we started with the stone aggregate. We spent about a month and a half picking the stones. And then we experimented with different sands and different cements. Um, so that's what you see here. So this is all with the same stone, but just taking, uh, playing with the other variables until we were sort of happy. And, uh, <clears throat> and then once we've got it figured out, we make a mock-up. So this is about a 12 by 12 mock-up. And it includes every condition that that slab uh, will have to encounter. So from a tree pit to a moss pit to um, uh, this is kind of a recessed glazing channel that's a foundation wall and so on. <clears throat> um, you know, saw cuts, saw cut joints and pore joints here. And there's quite a bit of complex uh, machinery inside of the slab. So the red tubing you see there is a snow melt system. So that, that's a hydronic uh, uh, system that heats the slab so they never have to shovel it or pour salt on it, which would of course ruin the concrete. So when the snow falls, it just it lands and evaporates in the wintertime. Uh, there's also conduit in there. There's uh, tons of rebar to keep it from cracking. There's an aeration system for the trees. It's actually quite complicated. But <clears throat> so this is a view of kind of the end result. And, and, and it, it speaks to kind of the broader uh, approach to materiality in the project, which is one of kind of a transcendent materiality. The idea that we could start with very humble materials uh, concrete, plywood, corrugated metal, and we could manipulate them and work with them to elevate them, take something ordinary and make it special. So <clears throat> it's not about kind of taking, using fancy materials, uh, but really taking something very humble and working it. So we added slag and we sandblasted it. So the whole slab is sandblasted. So it's <clears throat> maybe recognizable as concrete, but a very but may, perhaps not like any concrete you've ever seen. And so um, the model for this is really poetry itself because poets um, do the same things with words. They take very simple words and by their arrangement and, and rhythm and the spaces between the words, they create poetry. Poetry is not about taking very kind of fancy or words or words that nobody understands, but taking very common things and making it special. So that was the the approach to, that we took to materiality uh, throughout the building. So these are some details of <clears throat> uh, how some of these materials come together. This is actually uh, very late in the process. Uh, the alderman uh, came to us. Alderman is the local politician and said, uh, you know, how do we keep vagrants out of there at nighttime? I want a gate. And uh, we didn't want to put a gate because a gate would send the wrong message. Uh, and the message that we were trying to send was, you know, please come in, we're, we're happy you're here. <clears throat> Just like the GM Tech Center. So uh, <clears throat> this is the, uh, what, the, the solution we came up with, create a gate in the floor. So this is actually a panel that rotates uh, on hydraulics into a vertical position. So <clears throat> with the press of a switch, that panel comes up to a vertical position to, to every night so that people can't get in uh, to the garden at nighttime. So this is kind of winding through that kind of narrow space, finding your way to the front door, and then upon entering, looking into uh, the library there. <clears throat> the library looks out, looks out onto the garden. These books, they have 35,000 volumes, which were, were all in storage and not accessible to the public. So the idea was to bring them out of storage and make them accessible to the public uh, in, in this space where they could 
uh, <clears throat> there were recording rooms and, and listening rooms and uh, also kind of online uh, access. So here's where they were stored previously and then here are the Baltic birch uh, shells just with a clear simple Baltic birch plywood with a clear finish that we use for the shelving that runs all the way around the building. <clears throat> You'll notice this little gravel trench here. These stones um, are actually the aggregate that we used in the concrete and I wanted to make legible that moment uh, where the garden ends. So the garden starts, it's very clear where the garden starts at the step at the edge of the project. I wanted to kind of define the other edge. So this is how that was done by stopping the slab in front of the shelves and then putting in the scrabble trench and that <clears throat> travels all the way around the ground floor. So you can see that here. <clears throat> There's a little balcony inside of uh, <clears throat> the library there. This is actually, there's some veneered panels here, so we found an, uh, what's called ice birch veneer that matches the Baltic birch, and this is selecting uh, the different flitches of wood that will go uh, on these panels <coughs> that wrap the building. Uh, this is looking, uh, this is the glass system, which was a custom glass system because it's supported off the foundation here, and it spans 36 feet, and it's pinned uh, at the head. So there's no system, no off-the-shelf system that one, could, that one could buy that would span that far. So uh, we found that we could have a much cleaner and more cost-effective system by doing kind of a custom uh, mullion. So that's what you see there. <coughs> the unitized system. So it came to the site in, in uh, uh, pieces that are a meter wide and 36 feet tall. And this is a little device the glazing company invented to take it from a horizontal position and rotate it in midair and then set it down and interlock it. Uh, with the next piece uh, next to it. <clears throat> this is this uh, gallery space here looking towards the poetry reading room. We wanted to remember uh, Harriet in some way, so we felt uh, upon entering the room where the poets would recite their work was the best place to do it. We took an old photograph and digitized it, uh, expanded it, and created this kind of vinyl transfer to kind of make her sort of a permanent part uh, of the architecture. This is the performance space where the poetry readings are held. So the poet would stand here against the backdrop of the garden and the library, and the audience would sit in the chairs. <coughs> I wanted to do this space out of glass because I wanted you to feel um, when you were listening to this poetry that you were part of the city. So that you can sit in this room and you can see the activity on the street while you're listening to the poet. So it's not a hermetic box that's sealed off, uh, but you really feel like you're part of the city. You're part of all this activity, but you can't hear it. So one of the, the, the hard things, <clears throat> these are some of the other things you can do in there, kind of multifunctions. But the acoustics was a challenge because uh, the glass, we had, uh, in two terms, right? We had to uh, isolate the outside noise, uh, keep the sirens and the car noises and the car horns from coming into the poetry reading room. And we had to work on the room acoustics, which is how the room sounds when you're in it. So <clears throat> because the charge given to us by the foundation was make a room that's perfect for the human voice so that we don't have to use any amplification at all. And so uh, <clears throat> some of the strategies here, this is a, a block wall, uh, a massive wall that forms a diffusive wall. So when sound hits this wall, it scatters off in all directions. So the room is deceptively simple. It seems simple. There's actually quite a bit going on. So this is if you took that room apart. Uh, here's the seating here, the glass, and the... Um <coughs> so first thing we did to buffer noise from Dearborn, which is a very busy street, was we put the chair storage room uh, between Dearborn Street and the room. The next thing we did was two layers of glass, actually three layers. So there's two layers of glass uh, here, and then a third layer inside, about two feet away. And uh, this is monolithic glass. It's about three-quarter inch thick. And then there's a two-foot airspace between. So the airspace plays a major role in this kind of monolithic <coughs> layer, and then the two layers out here. So an ambulance can go by, can go down the street, and you can't hear it. So it's a very eerie feeling to sit in this room and you can see an ambulance or a fire truck going by, but you can't hear it. Um, some walls had to be 
uh, absorptive, some had to be reflective. So the back wall is absorptive. Uh, the side wall where the speaker speaks is reflective. Um, the block wall is, is uh, diffusive, scatters. And then the ceiling, too, is very uh, kind of a layered system. So there's an acoustically transparent fabric. There's uh, low velocity ductwork with lots of bends in it to, uh, so that you don't hear the air coming in. The ceiling is actually on springs, so it doesn't become a diaphragm. <clears throat> there's uh, additional duct liner up at the ceiling level. And then there's actually a shape to the ceiling so that when the speaker talks, their, their sound, the sound bounces off that shape and can project to the back rows of the space. So what is kind of seemingly simple is actually uh, quite complex. And that goes down to the furniture. We found uh, a chair uh, that has no joinery. Join, join chairs uh, over time, kind of the joinery gets loose and it starts to squeak, which is very disconcerting uh, when you're trying to kind of savor every word that a poet is saying. So we found a chair that was put together like an airplane wing. So it's all made out of wood fins that are glued together and it will never squeak. This is the stair. It sort of takes you up to the second level. <clears throat> There's a, some, the early mock-up of that stair. So the idea is that, that, that we'd have it a double stringer, and then there'd be a single monolithic piece of glass that would form the railing. <clears throat> this is the view <clears throat> from the top of the stairs and looking back towards the garden. And here, you can kind of get the sense how the garden is almost uh, another room of the building. This wood wall that kind of snakes around and, and separates the open office areas from the more enclosed passing through the bookshelf. You go into these more uh, cellular office spaces. This is looking down from the second floor into the garden and also simultaneously down into the gallery. Second floor is broken into three areas. There's uh, a magazine and website here, administrative area here, and programs here. This, is, uh, this image here is standing here looking down into the garden. These are some early study models of the site uh, of, of the um, screen wall. And um, that we found that it was a very uh, fine line to balance. Uh, we wanted it to be open to some degree, transparent to some degree, but some felt more like fences that were kind of telling you to stay out. Some were maybe too opaque, some not opaque. So in the end, we just decided that this perforated metal uh, was what, what worked the best and actually what we could afford. So this is uh, looking at custom uh, made perforated metals with, with different transparencies. So this one maybe has uh, bigger holes or the whole spacing is tighter. So once we locked in on that, we started developing the support structure here in kind of rhino models and uh, uh, physical models. So this is a half scale. Uh, these are half scale models of the support structure, sort of alternate. So there's this kind of more mechanically attached one, and then this one, uh, this sort of extruded piece with, uh, uh, with this uh, separate piece attached to it. And then we made uh, a full-scale mock-up. So that mock-up is 12 feet wide and 36 feet tall. Um, and that's even in the mock-up, you can see we're still kind of testing out things. So we're here, we're looking at the spacing of these members. This is a wider spacing, uh, but deeper. This is more often, uh, but shallower. Um, but I wanted this sort of veil-like quality. So this is a section through the garden. This is from the street looking through uh, the screen at the building. And to have this very kind of diaphanous, kind of veil-like quality. <coughs> this is final um, images of the screen. Here you can see that moment where it goes from solid uh, to perforated. So my, my, one of the points in kind of putting these three projects together is to show you how kind of ideas develop over the course. Uh, you're not starting at zero every time, but ideas develop over the course of many projects. Um, <clears throat> and which started, this started maybe uh, eight years before uh, at the Youth Center project. This project would have kind of a dual quality. When you looked at it obliquely, it would look like kind of a monolithic block. But then when you approached it, and, and walked up to it, it would become very transparent when you look through it at 90 degrees. The color was important, that it be black, uh, because they felt black.
connoted uh, authority and seriousness. If you think of a black belt or judges that wear black robes, uh, but also that it had this very mysterious, uh, enigmatic quality that somebody would look at this building and say, you know, what is that thing? They would be intrigued enough to kind of go over and kind of explore it. This is the alley, the alley side, um, looking out. So just kind of dragging uh, that across. This is the, uh, what the building looks like in the evening when um, a poetry reading would be held. So this is how, how you would maybe walk up to it, what it might look like if you were coming to a reading, which I encourage you all to do the next time you're in Chicago. So thank you very much. <laughs> On the, on the youth center project, it was primarily an internal experience, that layering, because um, we couldn't really do that on the outside. Um, the client actually liked that because it, it, was, it reinforced one of their goals, which was kind of to have adult oversight of all the kids, because the kids outnumber the adults in that building about 100 to 1. And so what they liked about it, I mean, they, um, you know, I would, during design, I would make all these presentations about, oh, you know, this, this energy in the center where the drill team is will permeate the whole thing. And they, they, they would kind of nod, but I don't <clears throat> think they really knew what I was talking about or, or maybe didn't agree. But um, they saw that after it was built. And they said, yeah, you know, it really does do that. But I think during the design phase, the argument that, that um, was compelling to them was like, hey, this is a way <coughs> we can keep an eye on everybody because which is something they're constantly dealing with, you know, and, and um, how do we um, uh, make sure that the kids are safe? Because a, a, a lot of effort was just put into making the building safe because if kids don't feel safe there, they don't want to go there. If kids aren't safe there, their parents won't send them there. So, um, but yeah, that, I guess to answer your question, that was a case where um, there was kind of an intersection or a congruence of, of interest, though, for maybe different reasons. Yeah. <coughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, near the end of your talk, you mentioned that the ideas you worked with are ideas that uh, fell over years and over many projects. Yeah. One of the ideas I see emerging in the three projects you showed us tonight is that you can have of a limited connection to the outside, which is said minimum windows yeah. um, or, or, or veil on the outside. And yet when you walk inside, there's transparency and it's openness and a load of thin light and yeah. community. And I'm wondering if this is something that you're now, if this is one of those ideas that you're now working with consciously, yeah. between the exterior and what happens on the interior and bringing light. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, certainly it's, it's conscious. And um, it's something that I try to take to a new level with each project. So I think, to be precise, you know, what is, what did the Poetry Foundation do that, that the Comer Center hadn't already done? I think, um, you know, moments like um, <clears throat> moments like the one where you're kind of sitting on the second floor. Uh, like this image here. So I'm in one space, <clears throat> I'm looking outside the building and then back inside the building, you know. Um, and, and I can see, uh, uh, find all these different 
uh, angles or uh, unexpected things. And that's what makes people want to move through a space. So I'm very conscious of that. And I try to kind of ratchet it up, I guess, with each project. So um, of course, you know, the, the, the program comes into play there and so forth. But yeah, and, and I think um, uh, just the very simple idea that, that this kind of outdoor space, that you're really dealing with the entire site. You know, even if it's an outdoor space, that, that that's a room. And we don't make, don't make kind of arbitrary distinctions of, well, that one's outside and that one's inside. I, I kind of, that doesn't matter to me. You know, it's, it's, it's a room. You know, it's a space. To me, architecture is all, my architecture is all about space and materiality. It's not about form. It's about relationships. And so when I say it's about relationships, it's about the relationship, you know, let's say, <coughs> just to use the slide on the wall, <coughs> you know, the relationship of that reflection of that tree on that glass, you know. So if you, if you looked at this building and you drew each layer of it, none of the layers is very interesting in and of itself. It's when you compound them, when you bring them together, that, that it becomes kind of spatially interesting. And that's all about relationships. So that's why, um, you know, my work really isn't about shape or form. It's about relationships. And that's, it's about atmosphere and space, uh, you know, space and the materials that engender the space. That's what I'm interested in. And I don't care if it's an outside space or an inside space or, I think um, it just becomes a different kind of question. There's always material, right? So there's just the, 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 the question becomes different. Uh, so for instance, we did a project in Washington, DC, where we took an old existing building. It was an old commercial laundry. And we converted it uh, to condominiums with amenities. And it became about, that project was really about a dialogue between these two parallel realities. One was this existing kind of shell, which had a very interesting patina, a very interesting structure, and then the new things that we inserted inside of it. So the strategy there was to make the new insertions very discreet and very legible. So we used materials that were different than the original shell. We used kind of a hot rolled steel um, and, and, and uh, birch, uh, birch veneer. And we kind of inserted these pieces almost like furniture. So I think even in the case of an adaptive reuse, and if I showed you that project, um, there would be a lot of slides about, OK, here you are in this space looking through that space to a third space. So you can still do these things, but the question becomes different. I think each project, uh, your sort of material intentions need to be reframed with each project. You can't just do the same thing on every project. So um, in a case of an adaptive reuse, you're, you're, you're responding to something you know, that's, that's already there. And that will inflect or inform the materials that you, the new materials or new layer that you bring to the project. So it's just different kind of problem, different kind of question. We had a perforator do it. Okay. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's basically a sheet. It comes in a coil. That material that we chose is a zinc, and it's from Germany. And there's only two thicknesses that we could get. So we chose the thicker one. And um, it's put through a perforator, and then, uh, and then it's corrugated. And actually, those are two different companies. The company that perforates it is different than the company that corrugates it. Um, no, because mostly it's an outside space, so that it, that it doesn't, uh, uh, we, we do a lot of sun studies in the early site analysis phase to see, um, you know, what, what are the, especially important on this because there's so many tall buildings around. So we did extensive sun studies, which tell us um, 
And one of the interesting things it told us is that there's almost never any direct sun in that garden. So that informed the tree species that we could select. It informed, informed a lot of things. But that's why that wall can be all glass. There's no shading on it, right? Because it all faces north. It never gets uh, direct sun. So that was just, uh, you know, and so how do we leverage that? You know, how do we, what, what opportunities does that fact present to us as designers that we can take advantage of, you know? So certainly we couldn't, this building, if this building was turned 180 degrees, it would be a completely different building. Or say the site was not on the um, south side of the street, it was on the north side of the street, and receiving sunlight be a completely different project. Yeah, code-wise too, you, you couldn't, the building wouldn't work anymore because it wouldn't meet the energy code. <clears throat> Just one more question here. The three projects that you presented are very kind of introverted buildings. And I'm wondering, as you go out to make places like this, what role does the city play as you start to consider these introverted places or oases? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. I think, uh, to me, I'm intrigued with how buildings interface with the city. And the two, let's say the youth center and this one, they interface in different ways for different reasons. So down on, on, in the uh, Grand Crossing, that interface is um, informed by issues of security and so forth, and, and issues of identity. <clears throat> Whereas at the Poetry Foundation is in a very different neighborhood. So uh, the strategy there, though, is how do I create uh, something that adds to the city, right? That I, when I'm in the city, I look at that thing and what is my experience with it? And so the, the goal for the Poetry Foundation was to create something that was intriguing, right? It has a great, pre it has a very quiet but very strong presence in the city. It's this big sort of black object you come upon, windowless object, but this kind of veil uh, around the building is, is very intriguing because one can see in there, one can see a garden, and it really compels people to come in <clears throat> and explore. There was a big uh, debate during the programming uh, on the part of the owner. Uh, some people wanted the building to be private. Some building wanted, some people wanted it to be open to anybody, you know, who walks in. Other people wanted it to be more private, like you maybe had to join as a member or something. And so what, the, what they never resolve that, but I think the architecture resolved that because it's both, right? It's both, it's open to anybody who walks in off the street, but also it invites only those intrigued enough to take the effort to find out what it is. So um, I think that was one of the most successful things about it. So there's other ways of, um, uh, you know, I look at the city as space, you know, and this adds a space. So that garden space, is it part of the building or is it part of the city? It's not clear, but that's, that's the ambiguity that I wanted. And that's because it was a building for poetry in the city, uh, I felt that was appropriate. Uh, just wanted to ask about the uh, speaker, but also, uh, Miss in recognizing uh, our, our partners in, in lectures here, University of Detroit Mercy, and tonight represented by Will Whitting, who is their dean. Thank you.